it's a great privilege to introduce someone that I considered as a breath of fresh air back in 2007 in the Department of Health and that was when he joined the department as the medical director and that is Sir Bruce Keogh. Most of you will know Bruce from his wonderful work. He's a great leader, he's a transformational agent, he's a fantastic colleague, trustworthy colleague and there aren't many of those when you search around uh, in Richmond House. Uh, someone who really truly believes in the core values of uh, any centre like ours, any department delivering healthcare, any ministry that is coordinating healthcare. And that really all comes back from his background. Uh, a very distinguished surgeon. He moved from Birmingham to London. He joined UCLH, transformed their cardiac services. And I do remember those days. UCL was a basket, basket case with full of prima donnas who were the cardiac surgeons who thought on average that they were better than the person who created them. Uh, if you remember those guys. And in the most gentle, soft manner, he managed to get rid of them one by one <laughs> over a fairly short period of time and build a very, very strong cardiac department. Uh, and then subsequent to that, he was poached, as I said, in 2007 uh, to be the medical director in the department. At an interesting time, uh, he was instrumental in helping me in working in partnership in really developing that wonderful framework of high quality care for all and then subsequent to that really carrying the mantle and building the blocks across the NHS. He holds huge respect from all the medical directors of the strategic health authorities at the time and then subsequent to that I have never come across a medical director who has not seek the advice, the views and the support of Bruce and he's always had the time to give that in a very very busy job. So he's a man who's able to manage people below him, but more importantly, he's also a man who's managed to, uh, could manage, not just manage their, uh, the behaviours of those above him. Uh, you know, if you think some of the interesting debates in recent times, like the seven day working, he's a man who's restrained <laughs> many other silly ideas. So whatever you're seeing is, is, is filtered through uh, the intellect of Bruce in managing policy and directing the way in which clinical leadership and medical leadership uh, across the energy. So I really, considering how busy you are, you know, getting out of, uh, it's always nice to leave that place though, to get a bit of fresh air, see nice people. So uh, <laughs> it's a great privilege to have you here and thank you again for making the time and it's all yours for the next 35, 40 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Um, Ara, can I just say thank you for such a kind introduction. I think anything subsequent to that is only going to be a disappointment. So um, <clears throat> I thought it's kind of late on in the day. You will have had an interesting and uh, some intensive debates. I thought I'd just tell you a series of stories, really, about um, issues of safety that I've been engaged in and, um, and try and tie them together in a way that might make us just think of some of, the, some of the broader issues. When I think of safety, I think it boils down to the decisions and the behaviors that are made by individuals or collectives of individuals, generally, but not always, in an encounter with, uh, with patients. And we haven't always been very good at recognizing um, new initiatives. One of the things that I've been asked to, to cover in this, uh, in this talk is something about transparency and publication of data. There was a surgeon in the early 1900s who, was, who worked in uh, the Massachusetts General Hospital. His name was Ernest Codman. And he had the temerity to suggest what he called the end results system of, uh, of surgery. And he thought that surgeons ought to follow up their patients and know actually how well they did. Um, and people sort of accepted that. 
But then he had the even greater temerity to suggest that you could actually tell whether a surgeon was any good by looking at his results. The end result was that he was deposed from the Massachusetts General Hospital, set up his own hospital where he published his own results, mortality, morbidity, his mistakes and so forth. But he ended up being buried in an unmarked grave in Boston because of this. Part of his life also took him into the American College of Surgeons where he suggested that it would be reasonable to set up a, um, an accreditation system for hospitals, looking at very simple facilities that hospitals in the United States should have. The American College of Surgeons bought into this, and there were only a handful of things that they looked at. And when the results came back from, I think it was something over 500 hospitals, the American College of Surgeons were so disturbed by the results that were going to be presented at their annual conference that they decided not to present them. And the conference was being held in the Waldorf Astoria in New York, and they took all the data and fed it into the incinerators. And when you look back at that kind of fear that people had, it still prevails in some parts of our healthcare system today, but we've largely uh, overcome it. So my interest in this really started, I suppose, in the early 1990s when, um, when I was asked to take on um, the surveillance of the activity and mortality of heart surgery in this country for the Society of Cardiothoracic Surgeons. And it was at about the same time that events were beginning to unravel in Bristol, where it was becoming clear that there were children dying uh, in excess numbers uh, who underwent two particular types of operations. For those that are interested, it was atrial, atrioventricular septal defect, uh, which is quite a complex operation in the arterial switch. And that led to an inquiry that lasted three years and was, um, was chaired by Ian Kennedy, which in turn led to a series of recommendations. And there were two recommendations out of the, I think it was 196, which were quite similar. And they said that patients should have access to the results of the surgical teams that were, would be looking after them. And that led to a great deal of political interest. And that slowly began to be interpreted as patients should have, have access through some kind of public media to the results of individual surgeons in a league table. And as that gained momentum, I was then still associated with the Society of Cardiothoracic Surgeons. We were quite frightened about that um, because we weren't quite sure what it meant. And we felt that the current data that was available was not adequate, that it wasn't risk adjusted, and so on and so forth. And we kind of, we fought it in the media for a while. But we were also developing quite a comprehensive database with about 150 data points for every patient that was coming to surgery with the intention of being able to risk adjust um, and produce good results. And we were making good headway on that. But then the Freedom of Information Act came in. And on the first day of the Freedom of Information Act, my phone went and it was um, the social affairs editor at The Guardian. And he said, John Carville here. I said, John, I know why you're calling. <laughs> and he said, you have the results of all the surgeons. And I said, yes. And I sa he said, where are they? He said, they're on my computer. He said, I, I want them under the FOI. Well, I said, sorry, you can't have them. I said, because first of all, um, we've received no um, public money for this, so it's not eligible for an FOI, and I thought that was the end of it. A um, couple of days later, I started getting phone calls from surgeons around the country saying the Guardian have put in FOIs to our chief executives asking about our results. And within relatively short order, the Guardian had produced um, results for every heart surgeon in the country. But at the first tranche, it was all a bit mixed up. In some cases, it was um, just first-time surgery. In some cases, it was included redo surgery. In some cases, it was calendar year. In some cases, it was um, financial year. 
So we got into discussions with them. We helped them ask the right questions. They published um, uh, their league tables in the, uh, in the newspapers, and the genie then was out of the bottle. At that time, I was a commissioner on the Healthcare Commission, and Ian Kennedy, who had run the Bristol Royal Infirmary Inquiry, was chairman of the Healthcare Commission. So I said to him, look, um, is there a chance that the Healthcare Commission could help us here? Because if we're going to publish these results, the public need to have confidence that the results have been scrutinized properly and that they've been analyzed properly and that they're correct. And yet the surgeons need to have confidence that it's also been done in the right way. So we set up um, a joint venture uh, to do that. And we ended up with uh, quite comprehensive results being published for the results of coronary surgery, aortic valve replacement, and all cardiac surgery in a fairly comprehensive risk-adjusted way uh, in, in about 2006. The surgeons have never liked it. They still don't like it. They fear, fear that um, as the, uh, the patient population gets more risky, that um, it puts them under pressure in a way that they don't want. It feels it makes them risk averse. And many of the arguments uh, that prevailed at the time of Codman and indeed prevailed at the time of Florence Nightingale when she published surgical results even before Codman in London. So it was at about that time I joined ARA in the, uh, in the Department of Health and uh, there was several things going on. ARA had been invited in by, I think it was Gordon Brown, to conduct a review of the health service on its 60th anniversary. And the first thing that was required, well, you did your review, and I think there were three broad conclusions, uh, in my view. The first was that we needed to get a grip of quality, that we had lost the focus on quality in the NHS. The second was that we needed to re-engage clinical leadership in the, in the NHS in a way that had, it had felt disenfranchised. And then thirdly, that we needed to focus more on personalization in the NHS. And personalization meant different things to different people. At one end of the spectrum, there's treating people who come into your clinic with courtesy, uh, shaking their hands, standing up, treating them with the same way that you would treat a stranger coming into your own home. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, personalization is about some hardcore science and pharmacogenetics and pre precision medicine. But <clears throat> I think one of the great things that came out of this review was a definition of quality. And that was that quality could be measured and looked at in three domains. Firstly, how effective was the care that was being offered? Secondly, what was the experience like for people undergoing it? And thirdly, was it safe? And I'll come back to my definition of safety, I think, right at the end of this, of this talk. Um, we then had, had another discussion. I don't know whether Ara remembers this. He said, I'd like you to go off and develop a, um, a framework for quality. And um, I kind of thought he was joking, um, but he wasn't. And the Department of Health is a really strange place at times. I'll just digress for a second. Um, I wasn't allowed to write any letters. Um, I wasn't allowed to um, send any emails. Um, and I certainly wasn't allowed to answer my own post. And I th when I first arrived, I didn't <coughs> realize how seriously these rules were, uh, were adhered to. And um, my wife works in a hospital up in Birmingham, but I didn't know her email address. And uh, so I thought, I would send her an email uh, to see um, whether I could make contact with her. So I guessed her email address. And because I'd guessed it was a kind of curt email, it said, you know, dear Anne, um, or something or other, and it just said Bruce. And she looked at this and thought that, I well, clearly thought it was a bit unfair. I sent an email back saying, I love you too, <laughs> and, uh, which I guess was a ticking off. And then, uh, I saw an email going from the office saying, uh, Dear Dr. Keogh, thank you for your email. We'll pass on your sentiments to the medical director. <laughs> and that's, that's when I realized it's kind of strange. And then the other thing is, you're not allowed to enter anything into your own diary. And I thought, well, that's complete nonsense. And I tried, and this red screen came up, said, Access denied. <laughs> um, and I won't tell you the story about the time I bumped into Ara in one of the corridors, and he said, Don't tell them I'm up here. They don't know where I am. <laughs> 
Um, but so I digress for a minute. But when he asked me to, um, to uh, go off and develop a quality framework, it was quite a scary thought because I knew that people around the world had been focusing on this for about 30 years. It was, it was an enigma about how you did this sort of thing. And I went upstairs, and um, in my post there was a parcel. Now, as I said, I'm not allowed to open my post, but being a boy, you like to open parcels. So I said, um, can I open the parcel? They said, yeah. So I opened this parcel, and inside there was a, a book, which was a report by Sheila Leatherman on how much progress we had made in, in the quest for quality in the first five or ten years, I forget which. And as I paged through, I got to about the middle, and it said um, a quality framework for the NHS. And I just couldn't believe my luck. And so I thought, well, I need to go back and tell Ara about this. How long should I wait? And I thought about 40 minutes would be reasonable. And um, it was the best bit of plagiarism, I think, that, um, that I've ever been involved in. <laughs> Not that I've been involved in any of <laughs> And uh, uh, Ara rang up Sheila. And, and basically what she had proposed was seven steps towards quality. And this is something I'd quite like to, to hang on to as a... Uh, as a policy in quality because I think it, it really encapsulates how we can get the focus back into quality. First thing is you've got to define quality. And of course we had the definition of quality which I've just told you. And we did some work with NICE to, uh, who developed some quality standards for the major diagnoses and therapeutic modalities in the NHS. The second thing is that having defined it you should measure it. And once you've measured it you should be open and transparent about it. You should publish what quality is. And that led to thoughts around quality accounts and, uh, and, greater, and, a, and a more frank approach to transparency. The next step after you've measured it and published it is to reward people who perform well. And that takes you into the whole business of how we align our incentives in the NHS. And I don't think we've really got that right yet. We, a lot of our incentives are negative rather than positive. The next step was that you should develop leadership for quality. You need people who can, who can lead and who can sell the narrative and take their colleagues with them on the journey. The next thing is that you should, you should protect your gains. You should ensure that you maintain your quality. And that's about regulation. And that's about the CQC and, um, and maintaining uh, a very basic standard of quality. And then the seventh step was that you should stay ahead. And that led us really into the territory of developing the academic health science networks, uh, which had kind of emerged out of subsequent thinking from the academic health science centers. And I think if you follow those seven steps even now, they make quite a lot of sense to, um, to individuals uh, working on the front line in the NHS. We then had um, a couple of things that went on. We had the global financial crisis, then we had an election, a coalition government came in. And um, the coalition government were comfortable to, to accept uh, the definition of quality. But Andrew Lancey was in a slightly different place in his head and wanted to build on some of the work that... Uh, someone trying to escape the talk. Um, Try and, um, to try and build on some of the stuff that Ara had done. And he said, how do we turn, um, how do we get people to focus on clinical outcomes? That was his fundamental question. And how do we turn clinical outcomes into the currency of the NHS? Um, and one of, the, one of the benefits of working in the Department of Health is there are a lot of very smart uh, civil servants. And as we thought about this, I got a call one day from one of them who said, called John Stewart, who said, look, he said, I think I've got it. He said, there are five things that a healthcare system should do, irrespective of where it is. He said, firstly, it should stop you dying prematurely from things that the healthcare system can influence, so strokes, heart attacks. Secondly, it should look after you well and help to improve your quality of life if you have a long-term condition, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, cystic fibrosis, that sort of thing. Thirdly, it should help you recover quickly from a short episode of illness, broken leg, cataract operation, that sort of thing. Fourthly, 
it should um, treat you well. Um, in other words, there should be some decent customer service at one level. And at another level, patients should become increasingly participants rather than recipients of their care and that they should um, have a much greater say in what, where and when uh, they receive, uh, whatever it is that's on offer. And then finally, uh, that care should be delivered safely. And that took us into a place where we started to think in those five domains. But quite interestingly, the first three of those are about clinical effectiveness, one is about patient experience, and one is about safety. So they fitted in quite nicely with the def definition of quality that had been developed as a consequence of, uh, of ARA's work. Now, just as that was beginning to bite, we started to hear murmurings that things were not well in a hospital in the Midlands, Mid-Staffordshire Hospital. Dr. Foster had been uh, investigating hospital standardized mortality ratios, and there had been a number of alerts which should have alerted the system to the fact that there were issues in Mid-Staffordshire. But in the event, as the story unraveled, it turned out that they had a high hospital standardized mortality rate, where 100's the average, and they were running at about 127, close to 130. And that in particular, um, they, they had a couple of areas, such as um, urgent care for the elderly and stroke, where the, the mortality was uh, significantly higher than for, for other hospitals. And that ended up in the Midstaff's inquiry, which was um, chaired by Robert Francis, as you know. Now, what was quite clear from that is that at one point we had an indication of high hospital mortality, but as the investigation started to bite, it became clear that in certain parts of the hospital, not necessarily throughout the whole hospital, <coughs> that there were some pretty bad behaviours from staff. And that, when the, the report came out, that led to a question, is can you relate high hospital mortalities to bad behaviours or other things going on in, in hospitals? And as a consequence of that, I was asked to, uh, to investigate hospitals with the highest mortality in the country. And we started to look at hospitals that had had a, a hospital standardised mortality ratio greater than two standard deviations for two years in a row and similarly with the standardized hospital uh, mortality uh, indicator, the shimmy. And that gave us 14 hospitals that we could look at. And we tried to do some things differently then. Um, we knew that there was a lot of information floating around the system. We knew that it had never really been brought together in one place. We knew that different organizations inspected hospitals in different ways, ranging from health and safety through to the Royal Colleges and that there wasn't a kind of standardized methodology of doing that. So what we tried to do was collate all the information that we thought was around. That included information from the ombudsman, information from surveys of junior doctors, um, information from the litigation authority, uh, the usual kind of performance statistics and so forth. And then we put an inspection regime in place where we insisted that the people that went in to look at the hospitals would be people who really knew about hospitals, which was one of the criticisms that was being leveled against the regulatory regime at that particular time. So senior managers, senior doctors, senior nurses, but most importantly, in my view, junior doctors and junior nurses who can get right under the skin of what's going on in a place pretty quickly. Um, we also were clear that, some, that every hospital would have an announced visit but there would also be one or two unannounced visits. We were also clear that this had to be absolutely transparent, so when the feedback was given to the hospitals, it was all recorded and put up on the internet. And then we wrote reports which were, um, which were also put up on the internet through NHS Choices. <coughs> now, when we were coming to the point of, uh, of publishing the results, there was a lot of speculation in the media about needless deaths. Someone had added up the hospital standardized mortality ratio and done some calculations 
to work out how many excess deaths there were. And this appeared in the, um, in at least one broadsheet paper and some others as being thousands of needless avoidable deaths. Now, I found that quite misrepresentative because the hospital standardized mortality ratio and the shimmy, they're simply statistical constructs. Um, they don't tell you anything about avoidability. Meantime, we knew that um, Nick Black at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine had developed a methodology for looking at case notes to try and estimate the amount of avoidability. So um, as a consequence of, of that, we asked um, Nick Black and Aradazi to conduct a review to give, us a, to give us a feeling for what proportion of deaths might be avoidable in the NHS. And um, subsequently, uh, that group has looked at 100 random case notes in 34 different hospitals, and the answer is of the order of 4%, 3.6% if you look at it over the, the full period of time. So that gives us a feel for uh, avoidability as opposed to uh, statistical excess. Now, one of the striking things about Bristol, Mid-Staffordshire, and some of the hospitals that I was involved in investigating was that data was staring people in the face and more time was spent arguing about the data, arguing about the veracity of the analysis and denying what it might mean rather than actually dealing with the problem. So meantime, bad things were going on. And I found myself confronted in, in quite a an interesting way with that particular phenomenon um, uh, on Monday, Thursday, it must have been two, maybe three years ago, when that week I had two phone calls. One was from a very senior surgeon in Birmingham, a, a pediatric cardiac surgeon who's got an international reputation who said, there are bad things going on in Leeds. He said, um, so they've got four surgeons, one suspended, um, two are locums, and the senior surgeon this weekend, meaning the long weekend, is going to be out of town. He's on holiday. And I said, yeah, well, you know, locums may be fine. We had a conversation. He said, you've got to do something. I said, who's kind of alerted you to this? And he said, another surgeon. I said, well, get him to give me a call. So anyway, the other guy did give me a call in time, and I said, um, he was from Newcastle. I said, look, if you want me to intervene, I said, I can protect your anonymity for a short period of time, but A, you have to be prepared to put stuff in writing, and B, you need to be clear that, um, uh, that this cannot be anonymous. You know, this will be a significant issue. So he said he was prepared to do that. And anyway, I had an office in Leeds at that particular time, and I was walking up to the office. It's about 4 o'clock. Um, on, I think, the Wednesday afternoon. And I got a phone call from Roger Boyle, who had been the National Clinical Director for Heart Disease, a guy who's made a bigger contribution to cardiovascular disease in this country than anybody else since the inception of the NHS. And he was, he was in a state. He said, you've got to do something. He said, we've just analyzed some data. He said, there's clear blue water between Leeds and anywhere else. And, um, and you've got to intervene. I said, well, send me the date. He said, I can't. I said, well, you know, why are you bothering to call me? Um, so in the end, he did send me the data. And what it showed was that on a partially risk-adjusted model that Leeds had a mortality that was 2.75 times higher than the national average with clear blue water between Leeds and anywhere else. Now, I made the assumption that that data was probably pretty accurate because the national clinical audit was run by people in Leeds. So you, when I used to run the adult one, I used to make sure, well, I was in Birmingham at the time, that our data was pretty good. So I, um, I met with the uh, next morning at 7 o'clock with the trust chairman and the chief executive, and, uh, and we had a chat. And I said, look, um, have you seen this data? They said, no. I said, you've got the weekend to see whether this data is accurate or not. And they said it would take them more than the weekend, which in itself worried me. 
And I said, I'll leave without saying anything, you know, but this is for you guys to sort out. Anyway, uh, within a couple of hours, all hell broke loose. And, um, and there was a lot of discussion in the media um, about whether I'd done the right thing or not, because they had asked me what I thought they should do. I said, if this is guilty knowledge, if either the state is correct or it isn't, you've got the weekend to check, but until you know, I think you should suspend your children's heart surgery. And um, that, of course, was interpreted as me shutting them down. Uh, they, they asked me what authority I had. I said, I've got no authority at all other than uh, I'm a cardiac surgeon. I've been working data most of my career, and, um, and I'm medical director of the NHS. Um, so, you know, it's up to you. And um, they did. But there were debates in the House of Commons. There were debates in the media. Um, and there were very polarized views. But what I was trying to establish at that time was the precautionary principle. What I did not want to happen was what had happened in Bristol, what had happened in Mid-Staffordshire, and what had happened in some other hospitals, that we did nothing until some time down the line we were sure the data was OK, because people can die and be harmed in that space of time. So I <coughs> remain committed to the, to the principle of, um, of precaution in all of this. And um, I hope that we can get that ingrained as a, um, as, a, as a kind of standard procedure in the NHS. There have been some other things where we've learned some interesting lessons about um, <coughs> tackling safety. Um, so it must have been round about 2009, I think, I got summoned to an all-party parliamentary group with Liam Donaldson and some others uh, to talk about uh, venous thromboembolism. And there were about 50 people in the room, not dissimilar to the number here. And um, evidence was presented that 38,000 people a year were suffering from venous thromboembolism, are dying from venous thromboembolism, that's blood clots to the heart in our hospitals. And the researchers were saying that 25,000 of those were preventable. And what struck me was the researchers didn't seem to be arguing with each other, which seemed a bit unusual. Um, and then we got to a point in the discussion where people said, what are you going to do about it? And I thought that's kind of odd. The president of the Royal College of Surgeons stood up and said, I did my thesis in this 30 years ago. And he said, nothing's changed. Why don't you make it mandatory that people get what they need to prevent venous thromboembolism? And then the president of the Royal College of Physicians stood up and said exactly the same. And I gave a wishy-washy answer about local autonomy, clinical judgment, um, you know, not for people in Whitehall to tell others what to do. Um, and there were some pretty unconvincing faces, unconvincing looks from people in the audience. <coughs> And um, as I walked back to my office, which wasn't far away, I thought, why, why are the leaders, oh, thank you very much, why are the leaders of the medical profession turning to me as a sort of dark, dark bureaucratic agent to tell them, force them to do what they know they need to do? Then it dawned on me that wasn't what they were asking. They were saying, make it easier for us to do what we know we need to do. Um, Mike Durkin at that time was one of the Strategic Health Authority Medical Directors. So the 10 Strategic Health Authority Medical Directors got together and said, can we find common cause on this? We thought we could. We then met with the presidents of all the Royal Colleges and said, can we tackle this together? And this is where I think we learned quite an interesting lesson because the workforce in the NHS is quite tribal. You know, if you're a nurse, you're a nurse. If you're a physiotherapist, you're a physiotherapist. If you're a doctor, you're either a physician or a surgeon, and it gets even more tribal than that. You could even be an anaesthetist, Mike. And, um, <clears throat> and we realized that if we use the, the colleges and the tribal communication systems, we could get people to accept that there was, that there was a real narrative, a real imperative to do something. And so the colleges agreed to do that. 
and we agreed to go away and put um, the necessary financial levers and, uh, into the system, which included financial levers, some penalties, and um, a good degree of transparency about who was doing what. And we went, it's difficult to know what the assessment rate for people's risk of venous thromboembolism was when we started, but we think it was probably around about 25%. Within 18 months, and Mike was, took a leadership role in this, within 18 months we'd got up to over 90%, and we started to see evidence of reductions in mortality from venous thromboembolism. So I learned quite a lot there about how you can work with people on the front line with the professional groups um, and what their role is in this, which I think is about leadership and selling the argument. And the job of the dark agents like me is to help put um, mechanisms in place to, uh, to make that happen. <clears throat> and then the last thing I'd just like to mention to you, many of you will be aware um, that I've become interested in promoting a much greater seven-day service in the NHS. And that story goes back to, um, to November 2009, when Dr. Foster published some hospital, episode, uh, some, uh, hospital standardized mortality ratios, <coughs> um, which showed that some hospitals were in really quite a bad place. And the medical director for the south coast of England, William Roche, came to one of our medical director meetings and said, look, he said, we've had a look at this, and we think that um, those hospitals with a high mortality rate have a particularly high one at the weekend. And I thought to myself, well, the south coast is likely to be a place with a significant mortality because of the demographics. But I was still part and still am part of a research group in Birmingham where we have access to all of this data. So I asked colleagues to go away and uh, see whether this extended to the whole of the NHS. And what the data showed was that if you were admitted on a Saturday, your risk of dying compared with a Wednesday was elevated by 11%, and if it was a Sunday, it was elevated by 16%. Now, this is quite a detailed statistical analysis on 14.5 million patients, and the, um, the analysis took quite a long time. Consequent upon that, um, the NHS Management Board thought that it was sensible to tackle this. We set up a forum to look at what we could do to try and uh, promote greater seven-day services. And then we discussed it at the NHS England Board and, um, and introduced um, ten clinical standards which we thought would define the kind of service that people could expect at the weekends which were essentially around ensuring that there was better access to diagnostics, better access to senior decision makers, better access to complex um, treatment modalities, and greater follow-up of sick patients. And there were a bunch of other things. But that, that was it in essence. And um, <clears throat> the NHS England Board agreed that we would write progression of those 10 clinical standards into the national contract we had a deal with the CQC that they, when they inspected hospitals, they would look to see whether the hospitals were moving in the right direction. And we had a deal with, um, with uh, Health Education England that they would look closely at the training of junior doctors at the weekend. Because we had evidence from a variety of surveys that uh, junior doctors were feeling overstretched and undersupported at the weekends. And in the context of the European Working Time Directive, where they had a limited training time, I was concerned about the implications of this for the training of the next generation of doctors. And on top of that, the Health Service Journal did a survey of chief executives, which showed that um, most chief executives didn't think they were offering the same quality of service at the weekends. So <clears throat> I was asked recently by Simon Stevens, the new chief executive of NHS England, to relook at the data to see whether there was any difference. And that's what came out last weekend. And we looked at 2013-14 data, it's about 16 million patients this time, a very uh, complex risk adjustment algorithm which we ran not on aggregate data but on every single patient. So the, each analysis took about two weeks. Um, and then, you know, if there was a power cut, we had to start again. And 
the data was much better quality than it had been for the previous analysis, which was done on data from 2009-10. And it showed some additional things. Firstly, it showed that the mortality, elevated mortality on Saturday and Sunday prevailed. But it also showed a slight elevation on Friday and a, a slightly bigger elevation on Monday, which sort of makes intuitive sense as the NHS winds down a bit on a Friday and cranks up again on a Monday. And when you do the calculations, we had a very good risk adjustment algorithm for those of you that are interested in statistics. The C statistic was 0.92, which is a very good predictive uh, uh, model. Your mortality, your chance of dying for equivalent severity of illness at the weekend was about double that of during the week. So it was quite significant. Um, the other thing that came out was that our sicker patients were being admitted at the weekends. We don't know why, um, but it's clear that we're least equipped to deal with them. But one message that I'm particularly keen to get across was we also have international data and we looked at 254 um, ac academic hospitals in the US and their figures were slightly worse, not statistically different, but it implies <laughs> that this is not a problem unique to the NHS. It's a problem of Western healthcare systems. We have reason to believe this actually from other countries as well. And that, but I do put it to you that our NHS is quite capable of dealing with and solving the problem. So it's about ambition for the NHS. And I said that I would come ultimately to my definition of safety, which is how I'll finish. It's quite simple in my mind. Patients accept that their disease has a risk. They accept that their treatment has a risk. And they make a value judgment on the balance between the two. What they should never have to accept is that that risk is adversely affected by the way we deliver our services. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Thank you very much for that. Very thought-provoking. Um, I've just got to clip my microphone on and then I can talk. Um, we do have time for some uh, questions or comments. Um, I understand that Sir Bruce is happy to take some questions or comments. Um, so do we have any questions uh, from the audience you'd like to, to raise? Um, you quite rightly focused on hospitals and the question yeah. of quality. But I wondered about the other aspects of dentistry, I grapple with dentistry, so I'm going to duck that question completely. But in general practice, so the definition of quality prevails wherever you are. But the issue that we're having to grapple with at the moment is that I think hospitals are a, are a barometer of the system. They don't stand in isolation. So the things that affect mortality in our hospitals um, really start out in the community. So, for example, let's imagine this is, I, I'm, I'm making this up, so it's, it's not gospel, but let's imagine you had a hospital with a very high mortality rate for heart attacks, for example. That could be because the local authority and the schools aren't focusing on um, smoking cessation. It could be because the ambulance service doesn't get to the people in time. It could be because the paramedics aren't giving thrombolysis or starting treatment in the ambulance. It could be that the passage through the A&E department in the hospital is too slow. Or it could be because um, uh, they just don't offer a good cardiology service. So one of the things that we are doing is we will be starting to look at some of these measures. And the, and the analysis has started at a community level. And the question is, what is a community level? Is it a local authority? Is it a CCG level? And I think it depends on what you're looking at. Okay, next question, please. Yeah, yeah Sam. Uh, um, you mentioned that surgeons didn't like the publishing of the data. Can you share it? Because we can't hear you. Can you have the microphone? I certainly can. I'll talk up and do it. Um, you mentioned that the surgeons didn't like the publishing of the, the results. 
However, I wonder whether there is a natural equilibrium that may well prevail, where the risk and application of that risk actually leads to the rationing of healthcare. I don't think it leads to a rationing. I think it needs to rational yeah, healthcare. What will it need to? Yeah. And what I mean by rational healthcare, so I was having this discussion with, uh, with a colleague and he said, you know, with the very high risk patients, which is the area that the surgeons were worried about, um, quite often it, the sur it wasn't, it's not the surgeon taking the risk, it's the patient taking the risk. And that what the publication did was lead to a much more comprehensive discussion where the risk was shared equally between the surgeon and the patient. Because now the surgeon, if their results are outliers, also takes some of the risk. Um, surgeons, of course, are worried that psychologically that puts them in a bad place. But someone said to me um, that what it'll do is eliminate cowboy behavior. And um, you know, I, I think that's just a, a sort of thoughtful comment. I think the, the genie is out of the bottle. Um, about two years ago, I rang around the presidents of nine other surgical specialties and said, the genie's out the bottle. Cardiac surgeons are feeling on their own. Would you like to come on board in terms of publishing your individual surgeon's results? And um, I was, they all said yes. Um, but then I got a phone call from some guy uh, who was president of the Maxillo Facial Surgeons. And he said, hey, why didn't you ask me? And I said, well, you know, I thought max fax surgery was too complicated. And they said, no, 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 and they've come on board. So I think there's an acceptance that this is a direction of travel. I think there is a continued fear of the way that the media handles some of these results and the fact that by the time the results get to the media, remedial actions often taken and whoever has been uh, picked on is now okay and the problem sorted. Okay, thank you. Oh gosh, hundreds of questions that we won't be able to take. Tony was next with his hand up, so I'll hand uh, over to you. This is just a point of information, if you don't mind. In terms of the question about uh, safety outside of hospital, uh, we're currently uh, doing a study that's being funded by the Department of Health to actually look at how common uh, avoidable significant harm is in primary care yeah. and what the various causes are, which I think will help us to yeah. then yeah. Uh, find out the best solutions. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to come a bit nearer the back now so that we're being fair and then hopefully have time to take just one or two more. So can you pass that down, Steph? Thank you. Hi. Uh, what role do you think NHS England has in restraining the Department of Health from misinterpretation of seven-day service statistical data? Um. <laughs> A quite a significant role really but I think that's um, that's through two routes one is through our analysts and one is through me I've got one more up here and then come to you okay next question that was a fantastic talk um, I'm particularly interested in public reporting of surgeon level data as a colorectal trainee it's my future um, do you feel that mortality is the best measure to actually publicly report, especially in something like colorectal, where following elective surgery, it's a very infrequent event? No, I don't. I mean, I've... <clears throat> so when we started cardiac surgery, um, I was influenced by s stuff that was going on in, in America. I was on the board of the American kind of equivalent society, if you like. And they had gone to the Consumers Union, the equivalent of which in this country, and said, tell us what you think the measures are. And they'd come up with a, a whole bunch of measures. Um, people weren't keen on accepting those, those measures in cardiac surgery at that particular time, We're going back quite a long way now. But what I've said to the individual surgical specialty associations is you choose the measures. You know, and engage with your, um, with your patient groups to work out what they are. One of the problems is that a lot of the measures that patients find useful, we don't really collect. So you've got to start somewhere. And um, you know, mortality is a fairly binary measure and can be subjected to analysis. But the challenge is out. Think of other things. 
Bruce, could, okay, I, right. could I come back to that yeah. seven day working? Uh, yeah. Because it's, you, you know, it's creative and narrative that is polarizing yeah. the whole community. And you know that because you've had to deal with this. But I mean, <laughs> those results are no different than SMR, S HSMR and whatever. There is a fact, there is a higher mortality, but why is the attribution to hospital? Why we keep talking about seven day hospital working? Uh, we're getting sicker patients coming in. I mean, firstly, what is your diagnostic? Have you, you know, I'm sure you've sought out, what's the problem you're trying to solve, or is it a very complex set of problems, which is, in many cases, well outside hospital. We're talking about sicker patients coming in, why? We know primary care shuts down by about lunchtime on Friday as well. We know end of life, end of life services do not exist over the weekend. Social services do not exist over the weekend. So the only place you can actually go and access over the weekend is a hospital. Yeah. So yeah. trying to fix this by longer hours of all, I mean, there is an issue about the ratio of junior staff to, to patients. No question oh, yeah. about that over the weekend. Uh, but, so how, how are you addressing the complexity of this without actually completely polarizing the clinical community, yeah. both physicians <coughs> and nurses? May I just yeah. say, uh, and you end up in a very difficult place, which you've ended up before. Yeah. So, I think the polarisation is pretty recent, Ara. Yeah. So we've been beavering away at this, as you know, for comes how long, Mike? Since certainly eight, eight, 2009, yeah, eight, ten. Eight, yeah. Eight, eight. Yeah. So, and a lot of stuff has been going on behind the radar. There are loads of people going the extra mile at weekends to try and sort problems out. There are loads of hospitals that are working much more closely with their community services to resolve the problem. And it was, it's only become polarized recently. Yeah. Um, and uh, to be honest, that has been pretty unhelpful. Yeah. Um, so. And, and it's led to the, the, the paper which we published in the BMJ on Sunday, and which will be in the print journal this week, actually has been interpreted in some ways as some kind of political move, because it's coming out in the same week that the government are in discussions with the BMA over contractual arrangements. Actually, it's completely it fortuitous. It's completely <laughs> fortuitous. Um, so there are all kinds of conspiracy theories. But you know, the, the first thing to solving any problem is determining whether there's a problem or not. So this paper simply sets out um, a set of facts. The next stage is really to try and identify where the problems lie. Now if you go back to the 10 clinical standards which we looked at, those 10 clinical standards were initially drawn up by the London Clinical Senate. Um, you know, so significant voices in London thinking that these were the issues. And they do cover access to social care and what have you. So um, I accept it's a, really, it's a really complex issue. I think it's going to require some dissection. So there are some things, for example, where there is no weekend effect. So if you look at highly specialist services, cardiac surgery, treatment of uh, Q-wave myocardial infarcts, intensive care unit, no weekend effect. If you look at common, simple diagnoses, pneumonia, chronic obstructive airways disease, no weekend effect. If you look at complex services where there was a weekend effect that have been redesigned, stroke services in London, uh, national traumas, oh, I'll come to that in a moment, fractured neck of femur, which used to be a big problem, we have no weekend effect, and trauma services, which were completely redesigned, and part of that started in your time, uh, with 22 trauma networks. In the first three years of operation, we've seen the elimination of the weekend effect, elimination of variation between the trauma centers, and a 50% increase in survival for equivalent injuries. So this is yeah. about... Who's that? Sorry? Who's dying? Who are they? They tend to be elderly people with <coughs> multiple comorbidities, and therein lies part of the problem. But we, ha you know, we need to drill down further into that. We do know that in statistical terms that of the 11,000 identified for, that, that are identified in this paper, about 2,200 are related to cardiovascular disease. So that's quite a big issue. Another big tranche is, is cancer and I think it's difficult to unravel 
you know, I think that's about end of life care and all the sorts of things that you alluded to. So what I'm not going to shy away from are the facts. I think what we need is a sensible debate, which you know, is just eluding us at the moment. But we will get back to a sensible debate. Thank you. I think there's a question over here, and then we'll be able to take one more after this one. So. Thank you. I think it was very interesting to hear your perspective on all these really major recent mm. events. But I, it struck me that when you were talking about your sources of information, for example, in relation to mid-staffs, you didn't mention the very brave and enraged patients, carers, family members who'd raised many, many concerns there and in other places, nor did you mention what I think is the increasing patient engagement and involvement in all sort of safety uh, regulation and quality um, initiatives. I'm a patient, by the way. No. Th thank you for raising that. And I, that's just a lapse of memory. So when we were setting, so one of the things I learned from mid-staffs was just that. And so when we were setting up the inspection regime for the 14 hospitals of the high mortality, which set the basis for the new CQC inspections, we used patient feedback and public feedback as one of our very, very major things. So we advertised in newspapers. We had town hall meetings that anybody could come to. We had private meetings, uh, clinics that, um, that patients could come to. We had members of the public who worked who weren't patients and patient members on the um, on the inspection teams, um, so it was a major thing. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you very much. Um, let's talk about data for a minute. Uh, patient data. Um, we had a lot of um, things uh, a year or so, maybe two years ago now, with care dot data. And it seems to me that the NHS has a tremendous opportunity with enormous resources of rich patient data that could be linked and used mm -hmm. for research, service planning, education, patient safety. And we seem to be too afraid to do that. Um, and there are some people who have a particular view um, who are very loudly heard in the media and very little of the view of the potential benefits of doing this within sensible um, safeguards. When are politicians, when are NHS England and the Health and Social Care Information Centre going to get around to starting the conversation around the sensible uses of patient data in the NHS? Okay, so the conversation is at quite an advanced stage. Um, Care.data, for, for those of you that aren't, Care.data is simply a, um, a proposal um, to link primary care data and hospital data um, at two different levels. One's a kind of anonymous level, which would allow for analysis um, to help improve the NHS and to identify uh, problematic areas and areas of good practice and so on and so forth. You can see all the advantages. Um, and at another level, we're keen that GPs should be able to access hospital data and vice versa. So. At the last minute, this project got derailed because people were fearful of the security of the data, to cut a long story short. And, uh, and the, the project was stopped. Meantime, a couple of things have happened. A number of CCGs have been invited to pilot it, and um, they're about to report. Uh, the Secretary of State has um, appointed Dame Fiona Coldicott as a national data guardian who will oversee um, how that, the information governance around this. And uh, finally, the CQC have been asked to inspect against uh, information governance according to things that will be defined by uh, Fiona Coldicott. I, I think we were quite good at arguing the benefits of linking the data. We were quite late. So I, don't, I think the clinical community was quite late at coming to the, to, the, to the argument of that. We had the charities behind us. We had a lot of medical directors arguing for it. But it wasn't loud enough. The thing that um, 
that I'm concerned about now is there is another side to this argument, which I can't quantify, but I think we will be able to quantify, is that people are being harmed by the fact that we aren't linking it. So there's not just the opportunity cost of failure to improve, but the fact that people don't necessarily have access to data to improve their pathways or improve the way services are delivered means that we're doing damage. And I think we need to get that argument out as well, loud and strong, because I think that'll help to deflate um, some of the arguments against it. Very, very much indeed. Um, I'm sorry we can't take further questions as we're, we are six o'clock on the dot. Could I give you something just oh, to wow. say thank, thank you, you from much. the centre for coming to speak to That's us really today? Thank, um, you thank, you um, thank you very, very much. Thank and thank you for being willing to take so many questions as well.